Yes. How do I get to that? Because I go on my courses and I customize them. What do you mean about It's That's like a sign-in here. Yeah, I've got one that says, do not right. sign in. Right. I've seen that one. It wasn't here the first day. You just couldn't find it. Okay. Everybody ready? Let's look at our stoma breather. I mentioned use a pediatric size mask. Ventilate. Ventilate appropriately for the patient's age. So just because you're using pediatric mask, you know, he's an old guy with a stoma, what's the respiratory rate you're going to ventilate him at? Yeah, the same. It doesn't change, so you don't have to freak out or anything. I already talked about that. Okay. Another device you have to know, not that you'll ever use it, probably, but they have them in the hospitals. I'm a scuba diver. We have them on the boats. Flow-restricted, oxygen-powered ventilation device. With these, it's actually the, uh, the pressure, the air pressure, which drives this. And it's got a little button. You can push a button, and when you do, it forces out a fixed amount of air. So it might be set at, you know, 500 cc's. And you push that, and it's going to deliver 500 cc's. And some of these, they're adjustable where you can do less or more. Um, but usually, you're going to kind of have them set at one particular volume. We only use these for adults. You're still going to have to use your technique to seal the mask that you would with a bag valve mask. As I said, the trigger device. Now, some of them are preset. Some of them will deliver oxygen as long as you're depressing the button. You can see that can be a problem too, right? You know, you start pressing, you start talking to your buddy, and what's going to happen to your patient? Right? So you have some control issues there. That's the main reason we don't use them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. They have improved them a little bit over the years, but uh, we don't carry them. Now, they may be useful in this event because you can, you can, um, you can manage the the mask and deliver the oxygen fairly easily. It's much easier to push that button than it is to squeeze down that whole bag. So, Also we have automatic transport ventilators. If you're transporting a patient say from one hospital to the next <coughs> or from their home and they are on a ventilator at home you may have to bring them. We carry uh, what they call ATVs on most ambulances where you could switch them to your automatic ventilator. Usually, in this case, though, uh, you should have an ALS provider uh, that will be delivering this. Y'all can read about that. Oxygen therapy. We've talked about oxygen. Does everybody need oxygen? We all need some kind of oxygen, right? I like about 21% regularly. <coughs> Excuse me. Do all of your patients need oxygen? Do they need supplemental oxygen? Does everybody need it? Who thinks all your patients need oxygen from you? Extra, supplemental oxygen. Who thinks not? Okay, yeah, not everybody needs oxygen. But specifically, there will be times where you can tell your patient is in some type of distress, you're going to want to provide oxygen. <coughs> Respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest, you're always going to give them oxygen. If they've had a heart attack or a stroke or you suspect those things, you're going to give them oxygen. If they're in shock, showing signs of shock, you're going to give them oxygen. If they have any type of respiratory disease or lung diseases, you're going to give them oxygen. God, we've covered almost all of our patients here. Your head injury patients, you're going to give them oxygen. Now, you're not going to hyperventilate them, but you are going to give them oxygen. <clears throat> if they have any other serious injuries, particularly any bleeding issues, you know, if they're losing a lot of blood, if they're hypovolemic or, you know, you just notice they're bleeding a lot, like the station we were doing the other night, bleeding and shock, most patients get oxygen. That's just what you do. A lot of different types of uh, oxygen uh, delivery de or devices, different size tanks. Uh, the main thing you need to know about your different size tanks is not so much how much you can cram in there, but the pressure. We usually like them between 2,000 and 3,000 pounds PSI per square inch regardless of the size. So this is onboard oxygen right here. This is going to be your large cylinder 
on the ambulance. Now this one actually, some of the fire departments may carry a big one. Do y'all carry a big one in like this or you just carry the little babies? Or y'all don't carry any? Depends on how jump bag. Okay. Some of them I've seen, they're quite long. Like they're almost like three feet long and they've got a long jump bag and they'll put them in. But all of these carry, they're going to have the same PSI mm -hmm. per square inch. Between 2,000 is considered full. Uh, so 2,000 to 3,000 is normal. So that's going to be considered full. But you can imagine though, even though this one's got uh, 2,000 PSI, this one has 2,000 PSI, which one is actually going to have more oxygen? The big one. The big one, of course. So if you're flowing, say this biggest one, the one that you have on board, if you're using a non-rebreather mask, <coughs> open up to 15 liters, you could probably run this tank for many hours at 15 liters. Well, at least two or three hours probably. How long do you think you're going to be able to deliver uh, oxygen with a non-rebreather with this little guy? Probably 15 or 20 minutes or so or less it's going to run out. So you got to factor that in when you're delivering oxygen and be ready to change your tank as needed. Now we've been over this in the lab, the different parts of the oxygen tank, the delivery system, the tubing, the flow meter. Does anybody have any questions about any of those? Make sure you read about them in your book because there will be questions about it on your, on your exam. Now, your different cylinders, and I will tell you, I cannot remember these letters because they don't go in order, and so there's no relationship between the size, except usually, let's see, the bigger ones here are bigger, but like M, M carrot, you know, has 3,000, whereas H, you see what I'm saying? There, there's just no order there, so I can't remember. But it doesn't really matter. The bigger it is, the more it holds. The smaller it is, the less it holds. No, because I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to make you guys remember anything I can't remember myself. So, yeah. Just know the small ones have less, the big ones have more. Pretty easy, huh? <coughs> but, you know, you might be familiar with these. You know, I'm, I remember that now H is the largest cylinder. How's that? D is the smallest. Okay, oxygen safety. Yeah. Make sure, and I think Tim probably mentioned this, any... Uh, parts that you use on that tank, any devices, regulators, they all have to be designed for use with oxygen. Heaven forbid you hook up your, your flow meter, your pressure, ga pressure gauge to uh, you know, a tank of, what do they put in tanks? CO2. Yeah, CO2, that would be really bad. We don't want any of that in there, right? We don't want any carbon monoxide in there either, or whatever else, cyanide, I don't know what they put in those tanks. What do they put in there? Hydrogen, yeah, we don't want to be doing that. So they're set up with a little pin system. So, <laughs> so just make sure you've always got the, same, the, the right equipment to go on your tank. Now with the, uh, with the pressure gauges, you know, it's got that pin system. So the pressure gauge that goes on oxygen will only go on an oxygen tank. And if you try to force it, you're going to have a problem. But make sure you're using it, what's intended for oxygen. They're always going to have something green on them. Either they're going to be painted green, or the cap on it's going to be green, or on the shoulder somewhere it's going to be green. So there's going to be green stuff uh, to indicate that it's oxygen. The wrenches that you use to open that, they should always be plastic. Uh, I guess you could have some aluminum, but most of the time they're just plastic. Will aluminum spark? I don't know. Anything metal is going to spark. Once you get a spark around oxygen uh, in any petroleum products, you run the risk of, of fire. You should put a new gasket in each time you change a tank. So the gasket goes on your uh, pressure gauge. So every time you change that pressure gauge to switch it to a new tank, you got to put on a new gasket. If you don't have a gasket on there and you screw that thing on and you open it up, anybody ever had that happen? You had that happen, John? You open up that tank? I had one chase me down the hall one day. It was scary. So make sure you put that gasket on there and you get it tightened down sufficiently. Your oxygen cylinders need to st be stored somewhere where it's cool and they don't need to be stored standing up unless they're secured in some way. If they fall over and that skinny little neck breaks off, you've got a missile. That's scary. Uh, don't drop the cylinder or drag it around by its little neck. Don't drag it by its ears. I have you have done that. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, don't ever stand those things up. You know, I see it all the time. They try to stand it up on the bottom. Oftentimes, those are kind of bowed on the bottom, and they're going to fall over. 
Be very careful with oxygen tanks. They are very scary. Don't leave it upright. There's no smoking around oxygen tank. Does that freak you out? I've probably seen it a hundred thousand times, 10,000 times. It's going to be patient. You go to their house, they're on oxygen, they've got a nasal cannula in, and they're smoking a cigarette, and they don't know why they call on fire. So I can figure that out. You know, or you've opened the back of the ambulance, you're putting your patient up in there, you've got all that oxygen flowing everywhere, and there's the family just going like this, going, uh, can I, can I get a ride to the hospital with them? Yeah, you have to get that cigarette out of here, or we're all going to be needing a ride to the hospital. So make sure that family members don't smoke around your patient or your patient smoke while you're delivering oxygen. And just have to be firm, say, mm, fire hazard, there's no smoking here. Make sure you don't put any grease, any petroleum products, any adhesive tape around the cylinder. Just don't do it. Uh, cylinders have to be hydrostatically tested every five years. So they'll pull them out of service, you know, they put it down, so they pressurize it and check it. So uh, that's what they do. Pressure regulator, it's going to tell you the PSI, per square inch of pressure in there. So if it's one of those little tanks and you turn it on, it's going to say it's got, hopefully when it's full, at least 2,000 pounds of pressure in there. But how long is that going to last? It's going to last a lot longer if you're using a nasal cannula, but if you're using a bag valve mask, it's not going to last long at all. If it's a big old tank, it's going to say 2,000 square, uh, 2,000 pounds of pressure. And how long is that going to last? A long time. So you usually want to change your tank out anytime you've got 500 pounds or less. Now I'm saying usually because each service is going to tell you exactly when you've got to change it out. For instance, one of the services I worked in in Baldwin County, it was 500 pounds. So it was 500 pounds, whether it was a little one or a big one, you changed it out. And that wasn't a problem. However, there's something called uh, the safe residual. Did Tim talk about that one? You need to know this. I'm going to write it down so you don't forget. Does that look right? Safe residual. You can just memorize that. The safe residual of 200 PSI means that even if, uh, even if you could, you never want to drain that tank below 200 pounds of PSI. It will ruin the tank. It damages the tank. So if you bleed it down past 500 to 400, you better be changing it because if it gets to 200 or below, number one, you're probably not going to be able to ventilate your patient. You're certainly not going to be able to use a back valve mask on it. You might be able to push a nasal cannula on it, uh, but if you run it below 200, then you've uh, destroyed your tank and you can't use it anymore. Delivery devices, you've done these, a non-rebreather. That's how we're going to deliver uh, patient to uh, deliver oxygen to a patient most commonly, uh, particularly for a breathing patient. The non-rebreather can deliver about 80 to 100 percent oxygen to your patient, so that's a big deal. When you've got it cranked up all the way, and it'll say flow between 12 and 15 liters. Mm -hmm. I suggest to you that you just always flow it at 15 liters. If you start out to titrate it, you know what titrate means? To do what? To Maybe. Titrate means adjust it to your patient's need. So if you're flowing it at 12 and the patient's sucking that bag flat, then you're going to have to titrate it up and give them a little bit more. If you've got it at 15 and it just stays big old fat all the time and your patient's not breathing that much, you may cut it back to 12 or 13. That's titrate. So you will adjust it based on the needs of your patient. So that's a cool word to know. So in most cases, I just crank it up to 15 because if, if you leave it at 12 and you're really busy and you're not paying attention, your patient may be sucking that bag flat every time and you may not even notice it. If they're sucking that bag flat, they're not getting enough oxygen. It needs to stay inflated uh, at least uh, two-thirds of the way all the time. Nasal cannula. Y'all did this in the lab, didn't you? Put on the nasal cannulas? No? Okay, remind me to do that. We usually do that oxygen. I forgot. Remind me to do this. Um, 
for a patient that doesn't like to wear oxygen mask or they don't have a great need for oxygen, uh, then you might use a nasal cannula. The nasal cannula is placed in the nose and you will vary the, uh, the concentration based on what your flow rate is. So if you figure, what's the normal ambient concentration of oxygen? 21%, it's really a little bit lower than that. So if you thought, if you started saying round it to 20, then this is how we're gonna figure out how much oxygen we're delivering. See, it says it provides between 24 and 44. So if you put a patient on a nasal cannula and you put it at 1% of oxygen, you know, one liter per minute, basically. So if you say 20 is normal, if you put them on uh, one liter, you're going to give them deliver uh, 24 percent. So this 24 percent, if you're giving them one liter of oxygen, their uh, inspired oxygen is going to be 24 percent. And it goes up by fours. inspired oxygen to my patient, what's my liter flow? Six. That's right. So if you get a question on National Registry and it says um, you're delivering uh, your patient three liters per minute by nasal cannula, what's the concentration? You're going to know what? You'll start with 20, right? So 24 is one, right? One liter. 28 is two liters. What's next? 32 is three liters. And that's going to be your answer. Now, when you're using the nasal cannula, the top flow rate is going to be six liters. If you're putting six liters uh, per minute to your patient's nose, I mean, like their eyes are going to bug out. It's like, shh. It's like blowing a hose up their nose. So, eight, it says six is the top, but it's very drying. It's, it can be very annoying. So, use the lowest flow rate that you can and get the results that you want. So, what's the minimum? Uh, oxygen uh, pulse ox reading that we want. What's the minimum, normal minimum? Yeah, 95. So I'm going to titrate the delivery of oxygen so that I keep that at around 95. So if I can keep it at 95 and I put them on a nasal cannula and I can leave it at 3 and get 95, should I move it to 6? No. 3 is good. 95 is good. It's called titration. Okay, that was just what I told you. One liter equals 4%. So if you start at 20, one, so one would be 24%. It goes up from there. Partial rebreather masks, we don't use these. They use them in the hospitals. You may have patients sometimes that have these on. They're similar to a non-rebreather, uh, but there's no one-way valve so that, uh, that they actually bring in some ambient air along with this uh, partial rebreather. With the partial rebreathers, uh, it can deliver 40 to 60 percent oxygen, and you flow those at about 10 liters per minute. We don't carry them, but in the event you had a question on registry, just kind of have an idea of what that is. I'm not going to ask you what the flow rate is for a partial non rebreather. I think ETS still carries them. Really? Why? Uh, one slip on our jump bag one time. Really? We didn't know what to do with it, but you put it out. What is this? Yeah. They probably ordered it, didn't know what it was. And they, instead of sending them back, they just... Okay, Venturi mask. Here's something else you'll see in the hospitals. We don't carry them. With a Venturi mask, they can adjust the concentration of oxygen uh, differently than we do. We'll adjust the flow rate, but they actually adjust the concentration. And they'll mix that uh, based on the patient. And they will vary it based on the patient needs. We just set ours and, you know, hope everything works out. But, so they're more adjustable than a regular mask. This is a Venturi mask. But you can see these have little circles here on the side. So they're being delivered some oxygen, but they're also uh, taking in ambient air through those little openings. And based on what the concentration they want the patient to have will be what the flow rate is going to be from here. Does that make sense? Just know what one is. Tracheostomy mask. 
These are little masks that are designed to go over the, the, uh, the stoma. And some of your patients with a, with a stoma, they may be on oxygen all the time. So they'll have a special tracheostomy tube with a little mask on it. I've got some of those in the lab if I remember to pull them out. Usually about 8 to 10 liters per minute. If you pick up a patient that's got oxygen flowing and you're just changing over, just ask them what their flow rate is. Because you're not going to remember this. Just say, what do you usually flow this at? Oh, about 8. Okay, that works for me. This is a tracheostomy mask, and you can see, you can, uh, and if they have one of these, you can actually ventilate through this, and then the little strap goes around the head. I think I have one of those, I can't remember. Any device that a patient's using and you're not familiar with it, ask them about it. Ask the caregivers. Uh, you're not expected to know everything out there, and they're creating devices all the time, always something new, so just ask them, how is this used? What's the flow rate? You know, blah, blah, blah. Now, the ambulances are required to have humidifiers. We've got some water back there like this. What you do is you actually connect this to your oxygen device, and the air flows through here, picks up, you know, moisture, and then it flows out this tube to your patient. So patients, uh, certain patients with certain respiratory disease, it's really nice to give them humidified air. As I told you, that oxygen that we deliver is very drying. So if you have a patient with respiratory disease, uh, this is very useful. Your patients uh, with stomas, as I mentioned, they have a hard time clearing out that, uh, that phlegm and that mucus. They need to be on humidified oxygen all the time. That helps break that up so you can suction it out. Other special considerations. When you're trying to ventilate or provide oxygen to a patient with a lot of facial injuries, it can be very challenging. Uh, they may have a lot of bleeding, they may have broken bones, they may have swelling, things that are going to interfere with you trying to provide oxygen for your patient. Also, these patients will probably have to be suctioned very uh, aggressively with your little, either a French suction or it could be, what do we call it, a hard suction? The yonker, yeah, the tonsil tip, yeah, that's what you're going to use most of the time. And you may have to suction your patient very frequently, you know. You stop every 30 seconds and suction if they're bleeding a lot into the airway. Some foreign bodies, you may have to try to retrieve yourself. Um, we carry, uh, and you should be carrying some, um, what we call McGill forceps. They're kind of cool, like, you got little mm -hmm. handles here. They look like scissors, but they have a long... Uh, a long body and then it's got little pinchers on the end, you know, where you can actually pluck something out of the mouth if you needed to. Keeps you from sticking your fingers in there. Anytime you're unable to ventilate your patient, consider that you could have a blockage of some sort. You may have to do choking maneuvers on a patient. Uh, you may have to do chest thrusts to actually clear the airway. Again, with little kids, they become hypoxic very quickly. Their metabolisms are higher. They burn through their oxygen quicker. They burn through their glucose quicker. Uh, so you need to be very upfront and uh, attack respiration with a pediatric patient very early. They burn oxygen at twice the rate of adults. They have anatomical differences that make ventilation sometimes challenging. We'll talk about that later on to you. Make sure you don't overventilate a pediatric patient. When you think about the size of their lungs, I know in the olden days we used to talk about the infant CPR. For an infant, their lung, newborn, a real young infant, their, their lungs are about this size, about the size of a little walnut or something. Very small. If you start, you know, giving this whole number, you're going to burst their lungs. So remember not to overventilate with too much volume a pediatric patient. How do you know you've uh, put enough uh, oxygen in? Chest rise. As soon as you see the chest move, you're done. Make sure you use the right size face mask for the situation. Uh, when you're checking your trucks off every day, make sure that you've got an adult, two adult masks, two pediatric masks, and two infant masks. Uh, you don't want to be sitting there with the parents when all you have is an adult mask and you've got a six-year-old and you're trying to ventilate them, and the parent is a nurse. It looks very bad for you. That didn't so you clean those masks and Ditch them. Clean them? No, you ditch them. Like sterilize them? No, they go. They're disposable. So you just get new ones.
Good question. Uh, that flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation device, remember the big thing with the push button, those are contraindicated for pediatric patients. That means you don't use them on kids. Main reason it's very difficult to control the volume exactly. In a little kid, you're going to burst along easily. With little kids, we have a much greater risk of gastric distension. Um, because of the shape of the airway, it's more anterior and it curves up like this more. Uh, it's easier to hit the esophagus than it is, much easier to hit the esophagus than the trachea. So you're going to get more air going in the esophagus than you do the trachea. Okay, you know we're not going to do this. At, towards the end of the semester, we're going to look at the advanced airway. We're going to let you look at all the intubation equipment. We're going to let you, uh, you know, if we have time, try to intubate some of the heads. We'll look at some other uh, blind insertion devices. Read through them for your test, just in case there's a question like, which of these would be a blind insertion device or something? Uh, but we're actually going to go to the lab and look at these later. Now, if you're ventilating a patient that's intubated, some things change. One of the things that change is uh, the rate that you ventilate. And also, you have to pay particular attention to resistance in your ventilation. Particularly with the intubated patient, because usually I got a lot of other things going on. And if you overventilate that with that kind of pressure, you could pop a lung very easily. So in that case, you want to be very uh, aware of if they're getting very hard to ventilate. It's one of the things you got to look for. We call that decreased compliance. If you are ventilating, the patient's intubated, and you're ventilating with your bag valve mask, and they're going to defibrillate them with the AED. You're going to disconnect your bag and move away from the patient, unless you want to be shot. When you're ventilating an intubated patient every six to eight seconds, so once they're intubated, you don't stop. You know, in CPR we do how many chest compressions? 30. 30, and then we stop and give them what? Two breaths. Then we come back and ventilate, and then we stop and give them two breaths. Once they're intubated, you're doing continuous chest compressions, and you will just do a ventilation every six to eight seconds. Okay? You'll need to know that, because I know that will be on National Registry. If the patient's intubated, whether they have a spinal injury or not, they need to have a C collar on, a cervical collar on, and you're probably going to need to go ahead and mobilize them to a long backboard because they're going to be very difficult to move. Uh, but you need to make sure that the head stays straight because if they've got a tube down there and the head's rolling back and forth like this, that tube moves and it's going to be dislodged and pretty soon you can't ventilate them. So make sure you're holding on to their heads. Blind assertion. These are just some of the examples. Here in Alabama, we mostly use the combi tube. Some services use the King Airway. I'm not aware of anybody using the, the LMA, but CombiTube is the one that we teach on here. We also have a King Airway, and we'll explain those to you if you go on into advance. They're pretty interesting. Any of these blind insertion devices, you don't have to tip the airway back. Look where we are. Make sure you understand the differences between respiratory distress, respiratory <coughs> failure, and what's the last one? Respiratory arrest. If a patient has agonal breathing, remember that word, agonal? What, how do you recognize agonal breathing? Slow it's very slow and probably irregular. So if they've got agonal breathing, we're talking about, y'all can hold on, we'll be done in a minute. Agonal, we're talking about two, four, five times a minute, something like that, and very irregular. That's agonal. In most cases, uh, you might consider that respiratory arrest because they're like basically dead. Uh, anybody respiratory failure or, of course, respiratory arrest, you're going to ventilate them. Uh, yes. Supplemental oxygen. Anytime you have a patient uh, with any significant mechanism or any significant illness, you're going to use oxygen. Always use your PPE. Anytime you're ventilating a patient, you want to have goggles, at least glasses, a shield, and something over your mouth. So that nice one, that, that combo is nice. 
But when you, anytime you're ventilating a patient, you run a great risk they're going to vomit on you. Anytime they're breathing inadequately, those are patients you're going to have to jump in and start bagging them. So you have to be ready to do that. Positive pressure ventilations are really good, but it does have some negative side effects. So you need to read through those, make sure you remember what they are. Mm. Always be safe when handling oxygen. What are the signs of respiratory distress? What's at the top of the list? Altered mental status. That's going to be the main thing. Once they get really bad, you got an altered mental status. If they're compensating, then they're going to have a good mental status. Once they start decompensating, uh, then the mental status will get worse. So respiratory failure, that's going to be your altered mental status. So if it's just distress, they should have a normal mental status. Respiratory failure, you're starting to lose mental status. For a BVM, what are the recommended variations in technique for one or two rescuers? I'm not going there. You don't have to worry about that. Okay, on arrival at the emergency scene, you find an adult female patient who is semi-conscious. So how would you describe semi-conscious? Altered mental status. Her respiratory rate is 7 per minute. She appears pale and slightly blue around her lips. Y'all know where we're going with this, right? Is this patient respiratory failure or respiratory distress? How do you know she's in failure? Altered mental status, cyanosis, getting close to agonal breathing, right? Seven times per minute. Yeah, she is not doing good at all. Does this patient require artificial ventilations? You bet. <laughs> Okay, so y'all know on Tuesday we have a test, and we're going to do chapter, well, this is chapter 9. Eight and nine. The test is 8 and 9. After the test, we're going to do 10. Yeah. Somewhere like that. I hadn't finished it up yet, but yeah. Probably not that many. It's just over two chapters. you got to know them well. you got to know them well. Y'all have a good, safe weekend. Have you heard anything about the steps? Uh, they've shipped.